still remember the first time I ever bought a dietary supplement. It was the old Sizon product by Gaspari Nutrition, which was, as I remember it, basically a creatine and carbohydrate powder with a proprietary cocktail of other essentially useless stuff thrown in. Of course, this was about 10 years ago, and at the time, I thought that one tub of this stuff was going to have me looking exactly like the guys who were endorsing it in the magazines. I didn't really know much about supplements back then. 10 years later, as a former Canadian natural bodybuilding champion and natural professional bodybuilder, I would say the supplements I use to achieve my current physique comprise a very small piece of the puzzle. Just how much they contributed is tough to say because how you look is dependent on such a multitude of factors that all I can say for sure is that it had a lesser impact than my genetics, nutrition, and training, and of course being consistent with those over the last 10 years. But that isn't to say supplements didn't help at all. They certainly did, and so what I'd like to do here is condense all that I've learned from my personal experience and education into my top five supplements and delve into the scientific literature backing them. So whey protein is basically one of the proteins in cow's milk, comprising about 20% of the total, with the other 80% being casein, which is itself a potent muscle builder whose slow digesting properties might make it arguably a better choice than whey before bed. The whey versus casein debate is one that is ongoing in the literature. However, it seems to be the case that even post-workout, when, at least in concept, speedy nutrient uptake and delivery to the muscles make sense, a mixture of fast and slow proteins seem to be best. In the protein book, scientific fitness author Lyle McDonald recommends a mix of whey and casein to take advantage of whey's effect on muscle protein synthesis and casein's effect on limiting breakdown. For this reason, mixing whey with milk rather than water or using a whey plus casein blend would be more optimal. And ultimately, whey is at the top of my shortlist because it provides such a convenient way of hitting total daily protein targets. Protein expert and researcher Stu Phillips has been cited as recommending protein intakes for trained lifters of 0.7 to 0.8 grams per pound per day when bulking and the slightly higher 0.9 to 1.1 grams per pound when cutting. Just to keep it simple, one gram per pound is probably enough for pretty much everyone who is well trained and decently lean. And the bottom line is that supplementing protein can make it a lot easier to hit this target. And for the record, research shows that whey doesn't harm the liver or kidneys, uh, except for when there is pre-existing damage, a contention supported by the World Health Organization and Institute of Medicine. Assuming you have adequate calcium and vitamin D, the former of which whey is a good source, then increasing protein has no negative effect on bone health and may even enhance it. So my general recommendation is to take whey protein as needed to hit your total daily protein target of 0.7 to 1 grams per pound per day. Caffeine is a central nervous system stimulant extracted from the seeds of coffea plants and is the most widely consumed psychoactive drug on the planet. The main reasons I recommend supplementing it are because of its ability to increase power output and training volume while suppressing fatigue. A really interesting 2012 study split 16 rugby players into two groups, one with 4 milligrams per kilogram of caffeine supplementation and the other with placebo, or no caffeine. The subjects were further split into sleep-deprived and well-slept groups. The main finding was that sleep deprivation only impaired training performance in the placebo group, meaning that caffeine was essentially able to negate the effect of missed sleep. It also increased the loads used in the non-deprived group, indicating that even if you're sleeping just fine, caffeine may still be of benefit. And for what it's worth, the authors also noted an increase in testosterone with caffeine supplementation a finding that is common across multiple lines of research. But not only does caffeine make you stronger, it also increases energy expenditure. While McDonald's cites an extra 100 calories burned per 600 milligrams of caffeine, which is a pretty hefty daily dose, but even half that, or 300 milligrams, would still have a significant caloric burn of 50 extra calories per day, which can add up over enough time. It's also worth mentioning that caffeine is very susceptible to tolerance, which means that after long-term use, the effects will be severely diminished in what has been described as an insurmountable way, which basically means that increasing the dose won't do much of anything. The most effective way to overcome this is by cycling it. My personal recommendation is, assuming daily use, to take three to seven days off caffeine every one to two months for resensitization. But the length of time needed to resensitize will depend on how much you're taking per day, with larger doses needing longer off cycles. And quitting cold turkey can lead to withdrawal headaches, which is why some people prefer to save caffeine only for workouts where they feel like they really need it, such as when sleep deprived. Another compound worth mentioning is L-theanine, which appears to enhance the effects of caffeine on alertness and focus. One study in rats found that L-theanine could partially reverse caffeine-induced sleep reduction. So if caffeine keeps you from sleeping, L-theanine could be a redeeming sandman. 
Caffeine is generally recognized as safe, however, it's important to keep in mind that a single tablespoon of pure caffeine powder can deliver a lethal dose, and to avoid a condition known as caffeinism, you should avoid intakes in the range of one gram per day. I personally always stay below 500 milligrams per day, which is, as it is, admittedly high for the general population. My general recommendation is to take four milligrams per kilogram before training as needed. The basic goal of so-called pump products is to increase vascularity through vasodilation, or dilating the blood vessels. This is typically accomplished by increasing nitric oxide concentration in the blood, which tells the smooth muscles in arteries and veins to relax. When L-citrulline is supplemented, it's converted into arginine in the kidneys, which ultimately gives off a nitric oxide molecule as the cycle repeats. Because citrulline is better absorbed in the gut than arginine, somewhat counterintuitively, taking citrulline leads to higher arginine levels than taking arginine does. It also doesn't give you diarrhea, unlike arginine. And contrary to popular belief, citrulline is not merely a pump product. A 2010 study found that when subjects were instructed to perform as many reps as possible on the bench press for eight sets, citrulline malate was able to yield more reps per set Set for all sets after set two. And the impact of supplementation seemed to increase the more sets were performed. This means for higher volume training sessions with more sets, according to this paper, there's a very good chance that citrulline malate can help you crank out a few extra reps, with fully 100% of 41 subjects responding positively on set eight. The same paper also showed a significant decrease in muscle soreness 24 and 48 hours post-exercise, an effect that the authors attributed to citrulline's ability to buffer acid and metabolites like lactate and Ammonia. But even without these added benefits, the pump alone can make training more enjoyable and can make you look bigger in the gym. For this purpose, inorganic nitrate seems promising as well, but at this point more research would be helpful to fully flesh out its effects. My general recommendation is to take 4 to 10 grams of citrulline malate about one hour before training. If you'd like to give nitrates a try, 500 to 1000 milligrams an hour before training is a good starting place. While achievable for some, research indicates that it's not always easy to obtain micronutrient requirements from food alone especially for athletes, and even more so for athletes in a caloric deficit. In a study examining nationally ranked pre-contest bodybuilders, women consumed fully 0% of the RDA for vitamin D and only 52% for calcium, while falling short on zinc, copper, chromium, and others. In previous similar research, junior women competitors were described as being remarkably deficient in calcium, probably because so many women cut dairy from their diets, thinking it will by itself help them lose more fat, which is not only wrong, but presents a very real risk for osteoporosis if those nutrients found in dairy aren't made up elsewhere. Research by Misner et al. found that for 14 endurance athletes, food alone failed to meet the minimum recommended daily allowance micronutrient requirements in every single subject. And so while I think that one should always aim to max out their whole food options first before turning to supplements, it's important to recognize that food alone doesn't always get the job done in practice, especially for athletes. My general recommendation is to take one athlete-formulated multivitamin per day, especially when in a caloric deficit. Creatine is a molecule produced naturally in the body, but is also found in some foods like meat and fish. A typical omnivorous diet provides about one gram of creatine a day, which isn't quite enough to see the benefits you'd see from supplementation. Creatine literally has hundreds of studies supporting its efficacy and safety, as it's been shown to improve strength and power in athletes again and again. Examine.com references a strong effect for power output across 66 studies, which makes sense when you consider what creatine does. It allows for more ATP production when energy demands are high. And while creatine does draw water into the muscle through osmosis, it doesn't cause water retention anywhere else, and as such gives the muscles a fuller, tighter appearance, not a bloated, watery one. And while it may not increase muscle mass of its own accord, it certainly can improve performance in the gym, resulting in more weight being lifted, which means more tension on the muscle and a larger stimulus for growth, which is why long-term supplementation tends to be associated with more muscle growth. And there's no need to load creatine or to cycle off it, as unlike caffeine, the body doesn't develop a tolerance to its effects, and a 2003 study showed that 21 consecutive months of supplementation led to no ill health effects. It's worth mentioning that it's been hypothesized in the literature that so-called creatine non-responders exist, with one paper estimating as much as 30% of people falling into this category. It basically means that you just don't get the results that most people do when you take creatine. People who already get a lot of creatine in their diet 
so by eating a lot of meat, for example, and older trainees are more likely to be non-responsive. However, given the breadth of research showing an effect and the affordability of creatine, I think it's worth doing a bit of self-experimentation with. A good indication that it works for you is if you gain weight after supplementing it for a few weeks, provided dietary and training factors are being controlled. My general recommendation is to take three to five grams per day after training, or when most convenient. And finally, remember that supplements make up a relatively small piece of the puzzle, but there's more than enough science to support the use of these five when wanting to take your performance, health, or physique up another level.